All right, in this video, I'm going over prisoners' dilemmas. And almost any time you see this introduced, it's introduced with this story about two culprits who are taken to separate rooms, etc., etc. I'm not going to use that story. I'm going to give you the characteristics that are common in a prisoner's dilemma, and then I'm going to give you a few more examples that are different. And I think one of the things that can be misleading about introducing with that kind of weird, unusual story is it makes it seem like the prisoner's dilemma is this unusual thing. Whereas if you recognize the pattern of a prisoner's dilemma, you'll start to see it everywhere. It's so common. My first example will be a duopoly that's trying to decide, do you set your prices high and collude, or do you set your prices low? Another example I'll go over is the dating friendship example, which um, is the awkward situation when two people are trying to figure out if they should be dating. So one example is when countries get together to make treaties, do they actually reduce their carbon emissions like they guarantee the other countries they would do? So this is the classic setup for a prisoner's dilemma. We have cooperate and defect are the two choices, and for now I'm going to leave those generic. Here is a classic prisoner's dilemma, and there's going to be two characteristics that all prisoner's dilemmas have both players have a dominant strategy. So what is a dominant strategy? A dominant strategy is going to be a strategy that will always be the best response no matter what choice your opponent chooses. Now to go over what is a dominant strategy, I'd like to give context, I'd like to come up with a particular example. So we have cooperate and defect are the classic strategies, and I'm going to let this be a scenario where we have two uh, oligopoly firms, or a duopoly, and these two firms compete against each other. And they can either set the price high for their product or set the price low. And if they can both set the price high, that would be cooperation, which is collusion and it's illegal. But in the context of their oligopoly, setting the price high is a cooperative thing. And setting the price low is going to be a defective thing that's going to be good for their company but bad for the industry. Okay, so quickly, the payoffs here are if they set the price high, they split the market, half go to one firm, half go to the other firm, and the price is high, so they each get eight. If one of them sets the price high and the other sets the price low, everybody's going to buy from the low price firm. So the firm is going to have a huge increase in demand. In fact, the entire market's worth of demand, so they get, they get more money. And the firm that has the high price is not going to get anything, and vice versa, of course depending on which firm is setting, setting the low price, that's the firm that gets all the business. Um, now, if they both set their price low, they split the market as well, but um, they make less money since the price isn't as high as it used to be. So this is going to be a prisoner's dilemma, and we can figure out what's the dominant strategy by saying, okay, from player one's perspective, firm one, can look at this and firm one can say, if the other player, the other firm sets their price high, what would I have preferred, to set my price high or to set my price low? Well, I'd rather um, get the whole market by setting my price low. What if the other firm sets their price low? Would I have preferred to well, get set my price high and get nothing because everybody's going to that other firm? No, I would prefer to set my price low in which case we split the, the market. And you can, you can flip this to, um, to do the other firm's perspective. I'll do that real fast. So the Nash equilibrium in this case is for both firms to set their price low. And both players have a dominant strategy, meaning when I checked each of the other player's strategies, I asked myself, what would I wish I would have done? And the answer was always the same thing. You always wished you would have set your price low in response to the other firm's behavior, so the dominant strategy is low price. It's always the best response no matter what the other firm chooses. Now there's a second characteristic of prisoner's dilemmas. second characteristic of a prisoner's dilemma is that both players prefer the situation where they both played their dominated strategy. And that's the cooperate cooperate strategy. So we have a Nash equilibrium, but we prefer the catty corner situation. We prefer the situation where they both play the strategy that is never a best response. That's what a dominated strategy is. I wish we had a better name for that. Um, dominated strategy is the strategy that no matter what the other player chooses, that is never a best response. So we end up with this 4-4. Both players look at the situation and they say, wow, we wish we would be up here. We'd much prefer the 8-8. 
But this 8-8 is hard to sustain because imagine that we're cooperating and we're in the 8-8 and we've both agreed we're both going to cooperate, we're both going to set the price high, we shake hands on it. If we know that the other player is setting the price high, our best response to that is to defect. So um, even though the cooperative e equilibrium is better than the Nash, we're going to tend to collapse toward the Nash equilibrium because if both players know we're going to be in this box, they're going to try to defect to get more. And that's a prisoner's dilemma. It's those two characteristics. Both players have a dominant strategy. Both players prefer the situation if they would have both played their dominated strategy rather than the Nash equilibrium. Though that's the situation. So let me go over a couple of other examples. All right, here's the dating or friends example. So imagine that there's a guy and a girl and they've been hanging out for a while and they decide to go to a movie together. And they both kind of wonder if it could be a date or if there could be a romantic thing there, but they're not really sure. So you have two strategies. You could approach the evening as if it were a date and act like it's a date, or you could approach the evening like you're just friends and act like it's just friends and both players have those strategies and so we look at the payoffs and they kind of match the prisoner's dilemma so if you both act like it's a date both people do then you get a pretty high payoff um, both players get a payoff of eight of course if the other player acts like it's a date and you act like it's just friends then you the one who acts like it's just friends you get a high payoff because they're sort of making the first move you feel good about it you feel validated you get a a higher payoff than even if both of you took that risk. You don't have to take the risk, but you get all the benefit. But the person who acted like it's a date and while the other one acted like it's just friends, they get a payoff of zero or a lower payoff because it's kind of embarrassing for them, the evening's awkward, etc., etc. And the reverse is true depending on which party decided to act like it's a date. Now, if both players act like it's just friends, you get a pretty good payoff. It's much better than you acting like it's a date and them acting like it's just friends. So you can see that if the other player acts like it's a date, you will wish you would have acted like it's just friends. If the other player acts like it's just friends, you will wish you would have acted like it's just friends. So there's a dominant strategy of acting like this is just friends. And we, but we can see the Nash equilibrium is both players acting like it's just friends. But both players are better off if they both acted like it's a date. So this situation is a prisoner's dilemma. Another classic prisoner's dilemma is countries that are getting together to try to agree that we're all going to reduce our carbon emissions. So the strategies here for each country are you can either reduce your carbon emissions or else you don't do that. You, you keep emitting and um, that might have economic benefits, but of course you're all trying to create a better world. So if, if both countries, or in this case you can have more than one player, so this could be like 100 countries or 200 countries, if all the countries reduce their carbon, the world is a great place, everyone has a little bit lower economic output, at least in the short run, maybe in the long run the economic output would be higher if you reduced your carbon, but um, let's just look at, uh, say, the next 10 years or the next four years. Um, everybody gains quite a bit. However, if all these countries reduce their carbon, you might look at that situation and be like, wait, I'm just one country. My, I would prefer to get the benefits from everybody else reducing their carbon, but not reduce my carbon, so I get the higher economic output, but I benefit from everybody else's good behavior. So your best response to everybody else reducing their carbon could be for you to not reduce your carbon. And of course, if nobody else reduces their carbon, everybody else chooses the don't option. You don't want to be the only one reducing your carbon. That, that puts you at an economic disadvantage. So your best response is for you to not reduce your carbon. And so the Nash equilibrium here is for nobody to follow through, nobody to reduce their carbon. Both players, or in this case, all of the players have a dominant strategy, but all of the players prefer the outcome where they all reduce their carbon, um, where everybody was playing their dominated strategy. That, that's the preference, and that's why this is a prisoner's dilemma.